I'd like to welcome everyone once again to this month's Wildlife for Lunch webinar. This month's webinar is on managing for pollinators. It's going to cover bees in Texas. This webinar is presented by Dr. Ben Hutchins with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. He is an invertebrate biologist. Today's webinar is hosted by the Texas Wildlife Association, the Texas a and AgriLife Ex Extension, and it's made possible through funding provided by the San Antonio Livestock Exposition Incorporated. Ben, with that, I will pass the controls over to you. All right. Hey, thanks, Clint, for the introduction. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for being here with us today. Uh, so, so as Clint mentioned, we're going to be talking about bees in Texas. Uh, in particular, I'm going to be focusing on our native bee species and management activities that benefit those, those bee species. But just keep in the back of your head that while I'm talking here, um, a lot of these activities benefit a variety of species, uh, not just bees, but other pollinators and some non-pollinating species as well. All right, so pollination is, is an, a critical ecologic service. Uh, about 80% of flowering plants worldwide rely upon animals for pollination. Uh, and pollination is carried out by a number of animals, uh, not just insects, but bats and um, some other mammal species as well, and uh, birds. But insects do uh, the lion's share of, of pollination. And so plants, uh, they produce a variety of structures uh, to attract bee species. Um, sorry, y'all. I'm having a little bit of issue with my my headset. That's why I'm a little bit distracted here. Okay. Uh, so, just to check, everyone can hear me. Okay. Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Great. Okay. Let me gather my thoughts. Here real quick. Okay, so yeah, about 80% of our flowering plants worldwide rely on animals for cross pollination. And insects are, are by far the most important pollinators of not just agricultural crops, but our native plant species as well. And so this is really important uh, from an economic perspective uh, because the agricultural value of the service uh, is valued at in the tens of billions of dollars per year. That's just in the United States. And that's a conservative estimate because this is really just calculating the direct benefit of, of production. And it doesn't take into account indirect value uh, specifically of plants that are used for fodder or for grazing for livestock. So the value of pollination from an agricultural perspective is actually uh, greater than what's shown here on the slide. And obviously, aside from from ag agricultural perspective, the the, ecologi the ecological importance of pollination um, is just tremendously important, and and that the ecological side of pollination uh, is uh, has a, uh, an economic value as well. If we think about uh, hunting, fishing, and uh, also nature tourism, those are those are economies that are valued in the billions of dollars. Uh, many of those species either directly feed on pollinating species or those are species um, that feed on or those are species that feed on plants um, that rely on animal pollination. So, so as I mentioned earlier, a variety of species uh, are pollinators, uh, but of those, by far, uh, bees are the most important. But I just want to briefly introduce some of those other species. So beetles are a group of insects that we don't usually think of as pollinators, um, but they are uh, 
probably really important, at least for some species. Uh, the, the importance of beetles is, has not been quantified to the extent of, of other insect species like bees. Uh, one of the reasons that beetles are probably not as important as bees is that beetles don't have particular structures um, for the active collection of pollen. Right, so, so beetle species will visit plants to feed on pollen and nectar, and then they may visit another plant and incidentally transfer pollen. But that's really um, incidental. It, and you'll, you'll see what I mean when we, when we get into some of our, our, our bee species. Uh, the same goes with flies, and flies are probably the most important pollinator of some plant species. But again, they're not purposefully collecting and transporting pollen. The same goes with wasps as well. Uh, and, and in the case of all of these, these groups of animals, there might be some plants that specifically rely upon um, a particular butterfly or moth species, for example. But bees are really set apart because um, they're one of the few species that, that, uh, that purposely collects pollen, and uh, they have numerous morphological adaptations uh, for, for the collection of, of pollen. Uh, specifically, female bees have specialized hairs and other structures, including what's called a pollen basket. You can see that in this picture of a bumblebee right here. Uh, these are pockets on the back legs, and the animals are actively stuffing that pocket full of pollen and nectar to transport from one plant to another. They also have some behavioral adaptations that make them really good at transporting pollen as well. Many times they'll crawl uh, down into the flower and they'll shake or they'll vibrate to dislodge some of that pollen. And then as you can see in this picture, it gets all over them. Those hairs help to store that pollen or they're actively storing it in those pollen baskets. Just another picture here uh, that shows how well bees are actually collecting pollen. Bees also are really good pollinators because they exhibit what's called floral constancy. What this means is that when a bee leaves the nest and goes out to forage, it's going to specifically be foraging on a single plant species. So whereas some of those bees and flies and butterflies are going to be visiting whatever plant species is around, whatever flower looks nice, the bees are, in many instances, going out for one specific plant during, during a given foraging event. Uh, and so what that means is that it increases the likelihood that that pollen is going to be transported from one flower to another within the same species. Whereas if you're, trans, if you're transporting you know, rose pollen to a, a dandelion, for example, that's not going to result in, in pollination. So bees are, are really important pollinators. They have a host of morphologic and behavioral adaptations that make them so effective. Furthermore, we have a lot of bee species in the state. Um, we don't exactly know a specific number. Uh, that's because there's some taxonomic uncertainty within certain bee groups and because there are some species that haven't been seen in decades. And we're also occasionally finding new state records. Uh, we just had a new record based off of a citizen science observation a few weeks ago. So 600 species is a conservative estimate for the state of Texas, about 4,000 species in the United States, north of Mexico, and we have a number of, of non-native bee species as well. Um, so because we have so many species, identification of bees can be a major challenge. Um, there are week-long courses, intensive trainings uh, that occur several times a year throughout the state um, that train people on bee identification. So this is not a skill that we're going to be able to pick up in an hour a long webinar. Um, and so what I want to do is just at a very superficial level go through some of the different bee families um, and, and talk about some of the bees that you might encounter. So apidae are probably the largest and best known bees. These include species like bumblebees, carpenter bees, and, and of course honeybees, which are probably the best known species. 
um, some other species as well, such as the longhorn bees. At the, the other end of the size spectrum, some of our smallest bees um, are the helictidae, the sweat bees, or the small metallic bees. We don't often think of these as pollinators, uh, but they can be very effective pollinators for certain plants, particularly some of our smaller flowering plants. Uh, the megachelidae are, are a pretty diverse group. Uh, these include the leaf cutter bees and the mason bees. Those are the ones that we encounter most often. A lot of times these are mistaken for honeybees, um, but in many instances they'll have this kind of pointed and upturned abdomen. Uh, you can see it in this picture and that picture there. Uh, these are sometimes considered as pests because particularly the leaf cutting bees uh, will, you know, cut small circular holes in, in plants. They're actually using those cuttings not as food but to but to close off their nests. So they're harvesting plant material, but not to an extent that's going to result in plant mortality. So uh, sometimes gardeners will think of these as a pest species, but they're really not having a negative impact beyond kind of the aesthetics of, of, of plants that you might have in your garden. And then we have a number of smaller families as well, the mining bees, the melitid bees. So lots of bee species. Um, as we've been flipping through these pictures, you've seen a diversity of body types, and you'll see some bees that are really similar uh, that actually belong to different families. So, I, so identification can be a challenge. Um, near the end of the talk, I will bring up uh, one option that, that can help with identification of bees for those who are interested. Certainly our most familiar and most abundant bee in Texas is the honeybee. This is the European honeybee, although in the last few years people are starting to recall to refer to it as the western honeybee. Uh, as far as I can tell, the reason people are calling it the western honeybee is because this is now the state bee of Texas, and what kind of Texan would want our state bee to be a European honeybee? So we're calling it the western honeybee now. Um, and this is a really important bee for Texas. As I said, it's uh, distributed throughout the state. From an agricultural perspective, it's very important. This is what's doing the lion's share of agricultural pollination in the United States. And obviously, um, honeybees produce honey, whereas our native species don't produce honey, at least not in amounts that are uh, economically viable. So new colonies of honeybees are formed through a process called swarming. Uh, this, is, this is instigated through basically pheromone cues Hey, Ben, if you can hear me, I think we lost audio. I hear something now. Okay, I just got a message that y'all have lost sound. Okay, yep, you're back. We're back? Yeah. Okay, when, when did the sound die? Um, before slide 22, at the end of slide 21. Oh, okay, so it just, it just went out. Yes. Okay, well, I wasn't talking about anything important anyway. <laughs> <All right. laughs> okay, sorry about that, folks. Um, we'll, we'll try to keep it running smoothly here. So unless you've been living in a cave, you've heard that about alarming declines in honeybee populations. Um, but what I want to emphasize here is that honeybees are by no means an endangered species, they're still the most abundant species um, that you're going to occur, that you're going to encounter in Texas and throughout the United States. And, and part of this decline is actually um, because of economic and political cues 
So we've changed our census methods. Uh, some of our, our federal pricing incentives have been suspended, and there's just been a general reduced demand for domestic honeybees. So part of the decline in reported colonies relates to fewer people producing or managing honeybee colonies, at least in large numbers. But of course, there are also a myriad number of biological uh, reasons for this decline as well. And part of this goes back to uh, the biology of the species. So as you may have read on one of the earlier slides, honeybee colonies uh, can be comprised of tens of thousands of individuals. Um, and so anytime you have a really large number of individuals in a really small space, and you have lots of nutrient resources in the form of larvae, eggs, and honey, you're really setting the stage for um, the spread of parasites and disease. So, uh, so honeybee parasites come in a number of forms, uh, including external parasites that feed on larvae. There are also, also internal parasites like tracheomites that infest adults. Uh, there are bacterial pathogens such as American fowl brood that result in um, death of larva. This is a particularly nasty bacteria. Um, really the only way to treat it is to burn all of the of the colonies. So this is a really unfortunately relatively common but pretty pretty nasty uh, bacteria. Uh, then there's a lot of concern over the increased use of, of pesticides, particularly uh, ne neonicotinoids have received a lot of attention, and they've uh, the use of those pesticides has recently been banned on federal on federal lands. We also have reduced genetic variability, and all of these kind of play in to the problem of colony collapse disorder and queen failure, which is when a queen stops reproducing. So lots of problems facing honeybees, and in particular, managed colonies. Um, and so all hope is not lost, however, uh, because we have all of those native bee species, and as you'll see, those species don't live in the dense colonies like honeybees, and so they're not as susceptible to some of those infections and some of those parasites. Um, and also, our native bees are much more important from an ecological perspective in terms of, of pollinating our native plant species. And although they don't play as large of a role in agricultural pollination, uh, it's still they're still significant, and this this number here of three billion dollars per year as a value of of crop pollination by native bees is growing every year as people are looking for alternatives to to European honeybees. So. One of the challenges with using native bees in agricultural production is that most of our native bee species are solitary, so you can't get those large hives that you can truck around and to visit different fields. Um, and so the upside of, of solitary bees is that they don't actively defend their nest sites. And so what this means is that you can implement management activities or but habitat for solitary bees in your backyard, right next to areas where you work or play, and you don't have to worry about those bees aggressively defending their nest sites as you do with honeybees. So if we look at our solitary nesting bees, the majority of those, about 70%, are ground nesting bees. Um, and so they prefer basically bare soil or sparsely vegetated sites, well-drained soils, often um, small slopes facing south or east where they can uh, get, in or get um, warmth from early day sun. Sometimes you may see 
really large aggregations like the one in this picture here, and you say, okay, well, this isn't a solitary bee. This is a communal thing. Uh, but actually, these are the solitary individuals that have found a really good bit of real estate. So this is a popular place to live, but still just a number of, of solitary bees in one spot. Just some close-up pictures of what those what those nests look like, and the size and the shape of the cavity is going to depend on the species. There are a few ground nesting bees that are semi-social. So these alkali bees, for example, multiple females will share a single entrance, but they'll each have their own separate brood chamber. So this is kind of like an apartment where everyone uses the same door but has a different living space. Uh, and as you can see here, in terms of ground nesting bees, they come in a variety of shapes and sizes. So you can't look at a given bee and say, well, that's a ground nesting bee or that's a, a wood nesting bee like we're going to see here in one of the upcoming slides. So a smaller number, about 30% of our native bee species are cavity nesting species. So these are species that either will make their own hole in wood or in the pithy stems of herbaceous plants, or they'll use holes that are already pre-existing. Uh, so the, probably the best known are the carpenter bees, uh, since those are the ones that will be wanting to um, to drill holes in your, in your woodwork, in your front porch, or in your wooden furniture. Um, but typically a really thick coat of paint is enough to deter those wood nesting bees. So here's an example of, of some natural habitat for some of these cavity nesting species. So really easy management option here is what we can call benign negligence. If a tree falls down and someone asks why you haven't cleaned it up, it's because, you know, you're creating habitat for your native bee species. Standing uh, snags are also a pop, uh, can, be, can be used by some of those cavity nesting bees. Some other examples of some of our cavity nesting species. The mason bees are actually ones um, that folks are looking at using in agricultural pollination as well. And I've mentioned earlier the leaf cutting bees that are sometimes treated as pests for, for, for cutting holes in plants. And then we have a much smaller number of actually social native bees. Uh, in particular, those are our bumblebees. Uh, one of the main difference between uh, bumblebees and, and honeybees is the size of the colonies, whereas uh, honeybees can have colonies in the tens of thousands. When we're thinking about bumblebees, we're really looking at a few hundred individuals. And whereas honeybee colonies can persist over several years, bumblebee, bumblebees have annual, annual colonies. And so the colony will die off at the end of the year. The queen will overwinter in a leaf litter or underground and then start a new colony before dying off. So, so bumblebees nest uh, in existing cavities, basically on the ground or under the ground. So rodent burrows are a favorite spot for bumblebees. They can also use um, piles of rock, anywhere that, that provides protection from wind and rain and direct sun. A really important habitat is thatch. So where you have native bunch grasses that are allowed to grow and that grass dies and falls over and creates that kind of thick mat of, of dead and dying plant material, that's thatch. Um, rodents love that and they make holes in it and the bees will then go in and colonize and bumblebees will defend their nest site like honeybees. So the, the bumblebee hive doesn't look anything like the nice, sharp, kind of geometric combs of honeybees. Rather, they're these kind of messy-looking globular structures, but still a, a neat structure. And they don't really store honey 
uh, they'll store some nectar or pollen in, for short periods of time, but they're not producing honey uh, like you would see with honeybees. But bumblebees are, are really important in terms of pollination. Uh, they're generalist pollinators, so they can visit hundreds of different plant species. Uh, and in particular, they're really effective at pollination of milkweed species. So if you're interested in monarch conservation, then you should uh, promote healthy bumblebee populations. Bumblebees are also experiencing uh, some significant declines across North America. And we actually have uh, two species, not one species, that have been petitioned for federal listing. One is up in the Pacific Northwest and one is in kind of the northern uh, Midwest region. Here in Texas, we have three species that Texas Parks and Wildlife has identified as species of greatest conservation need. Those are bumblebee species where the population is declining. Uh, one of those species hasn't been seen in, in uh, probably a decade. And so those are species that Texas Parks and Wildlife is particularly concerned about. We're interested in data on those species and, and we're interested in really promoting conservation effort for those species. And really the biggest threat facing our native bee species, not just bumblebees, is really the large-scale conversion of landscapes that naturally support a diverse community of flowering forbs and transitioning to these basically heavily managed systems that don't have the nectar resources that those bees need. Uh, but luckily, this is uh, a, prob a problem that's well documented, and there are tons of resources out there for folks that are interested in in either uh, restoring or conserving habitat for native bee species. The Xerces Society, in particular, is is an excellent source of information. They have online resources on their web page that you can download. They go into great detail about region-specific plants and methods for creating bee habitat. Uh, they have published an excellent guide called Attracting Native Pollinators. This is basically a how-to guide for attracting and maintaining landscapes for native pollinating species. So really valuable and, and, and an easily accessible material to digest. You don't have to be a bee specialist to get some use out of that book. Okay, so so what do we do if we're interested in managing for bee species? And and so that's a big question, and again, it's not one that we can answer here in a few minutes, but I want to kind of superficially talk about some general management guidelines and hopefully provide you with some resources so that if you want to look into this in more detail, this is a starting place. Uh, and the management guidelines that I'm going to be talking about work whether you're on a large landscape or very small landscape. And the first step is really documentation. It's just take stock of the bee species that are on your property, of the nectar or the floral resources that you have and the habitat that you have, uh, as well as the resources that you don't have. Right? We've talked about what ground nesting bees need. We've talked about what cavity nesting bees need in terms of, of building and maintaining those nests. And so when we do an initial survey of the landscape, we want to look at what's there, what's not there, and then we can move towards conserving what's there and improving what's not there. So again, a, a part of that is looking for potential nest sites, or if you don't see the nest sites, do you have evidence of, in this case, leaf cutting bees or other bees that might be uh, utilizing resources on your property. So in, t in terms of active management, one of the imp important kind of important reminders as we talk about some of these different management activities is that whether we're talking about prescribed fire or in some of the subsequent slides, mowing or grazing, we never want to apply management to your entire landscape. So really 
as a general rule of thumb, any given treatment, you want to treat about 30% at a time. The reason is you want to leave resources alone. If you if you go through and even if an entire pasture needs to be burned, if you burn that whole pasture, you're going to burn up all of the floral resources that might be there. You're going to run nesting sites and all the bees are going to leave. So you want to leave areas as a refugia and that way you have resources and you have bees that will recall on that as those areas as you're treating them. In terms of prescribed burning, uh, we want to limit burns to the winter. The reason is most bees are not active during the winter. Uh, most of your flowering forbs are not producing flowers during the winter. And so you're really not reducing resources at that time. And we also don't want to burn too frequently. Uh, and that's because if we do, then you're not allowing an opportunity for those native bunch grasses to, to produce thatch. And as we talked about with honeybees in particular, you need that thatch uh, for, for habitat. Uh, but with those, with those recommendations, fire can be a really useful resource for opening up a landscape if you have issues with woody encroachment, such as cedar or mesquite. Uh, so it can also be a useful tool for bringing back some native flowering vegetation. Um, it also is a really big boon for, for putting nitrogen onto the landscape. In general, mowing and haying is not considered a particularly effective management strategy for bees, but it can be useful in areas where, for example, maybe prescribed burn is just not an option. Um, and again, some of the same stipulations apply. You don't want to treat the whole area. It's best done in winter. You don't want to do it too often. This allows time for some of the species to recover. You're allowing habitat to develop. And really, we want to leave patches as well. Many of these bees have really limited dispersal ability. Um, that dis the, the distance that bees can travel is basically inversely proportional to their size. So larger bees can travel farther. But for some of our really small bees, like those metallic bees, they may only be able to travel 100 meters or so from their nest site. So, so by applying management in patches, you're making sure that you're not isolating a nest, for example, from floral resources that may be too far for that bee to reach. And then grazing can actually be an effective management tool as well. And so managing for native pollinators while maintaining an active ranch or an active population of, of cattle is a viable option. Now, we're not typically talking about bison, but I just like this picture because I thought it was pretty. Um, but when we think about using cattle as a management tool, one of the phrases that you'll hear a lot is high intensity, low frequency. So the idea is that you bring cattle into a small area, allow them to graze relatively heavily, but for a very short time, then you move them off of that landscape and you allow that landscape to recover uh, maybe for a year or more. And this kind of mimics, or the idea is that we're trying to mimic uh, grazing patterns that this landscape would have seen from, from native bison herds. And Texas Parks and Wildlife does have guidelines for using livestock as a, as a management tool. Those are available through our private lands page. And so those are some freely available resources that you can download if you're interested in. Um, and the specifics of how you develop a livestock management strategy is going to depend on where you're at and what your goals are. And in some instances, it may be important or it may be desirable to, to actually reseed to augment food resources by planting some of those native flowering plants. This can be expensive, it can be time consuming. Uh, the scale and the conditions are going to determine kind of the effort that you need. And so again, if folks are interested in doing this, we really recommend meeting up with a TPWD biologist or perhaps a, an NRCS biologist who can develop a management plan that's appropriate for a specific property. Uh, but in general, if we're thinking about reseeding or, or trying to, to plant native flowering plants, 
uh, we're thinking about what we call a bee pasture. So this is basically a patch of floral resources that have been put there just for bees. Uh, and ideally, larger sites are better. Um, at least a half an acre of native flowering plants is, is ideal for bees. Again, bigger is better. Um, but we definitely emphasize the importance of finding native, regionally, regionally sourced seeds, um, because that's going to be what your native bee species are going to be looking for anyway. Um, ideally, when we're planting species, we don't want a, a homogenous mixture of seeds, but we want our different flower species to be clumped. So if you have a clump of the same species of plant, that's going to be more obvious and more attractive for those bee species. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of them exhibit floral constancy. So by putting the same species in one patch, they're not having, they don't have to travel as far uh, to find a different, uh, a given plant. But then you also want a diversity of, of flower sizes, shapes, and colors. Different bee species are going to be looking for different things. At a minimum, we want three different species flowering in the spring, summer, and fall. A lot of our bees, particularly bumblebees, begin foraging very early, and, and they remain active on the landscape well into the fall. Um, and so there's a big issue of providing a nectar resource at any given time in the years. And for folks that are interested, there are lots of online resources that talk about um, specific species of plants that bees tend to gravitate towards. Uh, so Lady Bird Johnson Wild Flower Center has some nice lists. The Xerxes Society does as well. And so those resources can help you basically craft your uh, seed mix or help you to identify the specific species that you would like to get on your landscape. In addition to plant resources, uh, we can also augment uh, shelter for, for species as well. So what we, these pictures show what are called uh, bee blocks. So these are for those cavity nesting bees. And you can go online and find, um, you can either order these or you can make them yourself. You can find how-to guides on how to construct these. And there are all kinds of tips on how high you want to place these bee blocks which direction you want them to be facing. And they require some periodic maintenance as well in terms of cleaning out those cavities after they're occupied. Uh, this is the same idea, just a, a different shape. But these are great for urban areas because they don't take up a lot of space. And again, because these are not, these species aren't, aren't aggressive, they're not going to be protecting their nest, you can set up these bee blocks in your backyard and not have to worry about getting stung. Here's some pictures of some cavity nesting bees utilizing these artificial cavities. Uh, if you have a bee block, you'll be able to tell when they're being used, particularly with these leaf cutter bees that seal up the entrance. Uh, there are also, you can get bumblebee houses as well, although I've heard that those are, are not very effective or that it's real hit or miss whether bumblebees will actually occupy those boxes, but they kind of look like a little shoe box. And again, you can find those online. Um, so with the last few minutes, what I'd like to do is kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about how we can identify bees and particularly uh, how we can report when we find bees. And so what I'm going to attempt to do here is actually shift screens and talk about what's called iNaturalist. So iNaturalist is, a, is a, an online platform that we at TPWD have really been advocating in the last year. This is a free resource for people who are interested in finding out what a given bee species might be at their house. Uh, you can go online to iNaturalist. It's also an app that you can download onto your phone. And the value of this is that if you take a picture of a given bee, you can upload it to iNaturalist. And there are all kinds of naturalists that use this site that can help you identify that bee. And so what I'm going to try to do now is actually work you through that process. Once you get good at it on your phone, it takes about 30 seconds, and show you how we can, how we can use this to help identify bees. Uh, 
All right, so hopefully folks can see the screen. This is basically my home page. So you go in, you sign up, you create a little profile, and then you can add an observation. And if, you, if you're doing this on your phone, the interface will look slightly different, but you're still going to have the same options. So the easiest way to add an observation is basically to add a photo. This is one that I took in my neighborhood a couple of days ago. And what's really nice is the, this option to sync the photo metadata. And so what this is going to do is that if you have your GPS turned on on your camera or your phone, it's going to go into that picture and it's going to grab the date and it's going to grab the location where that picture was taken and automatically put it up so people can see when and where that animal was observed. And then I happen to know what this picture was. It was a bumblebee. If all you know is bumblebee, you can just say bumblebee. If all you know is bee, you can just type in bee and it'll give you that taxonomic resolution. So you just get as specific as you can and then allow the community of naturalists to do the rest. So this was an American bumblebee, but I'm just going to say bumblebee, period. And then save that observation. And my guess is that Within an hour, somebody's going to come up and identify specifically which bee that was. So you can see I live in San Marcos. That observation shows up. It says that it was taken on October the 11th. And although you can't see the picture yet because it's still processing it, that picture will pop up eventually. And you can add to projects. So we have, in particular, Well, it's not showing up on my list. Well, I think this is an artifact of sharing the screen that is not showing the particular project that I wanted to add this to. But we have a project called Bees and Wasps of Texas. You can just do a search for that. And by adding this observation to that specific project, it's going to flag it and folks that are on that project are bee and wasp experts. I think we may have lost you again on audio, Ben. There you are. Okay. Yep. All right. So I'm not sure where 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 did, where did I where did you lose me at? Uh, you were explaining the the list where you can put it and that they're being wasp experts. Oh, okay. Yeah. So so by adding basically by adding an observation to a project, then then it's going to single that out 
experts that are following that project will be able to see that observation and identify it quicker for you. It's also useful to Texas Parks and Wildlife because it helps us to track, in some instances, some of our rare species, such as the American bumblebee. So, so basically, I just wanted to provide an overview of iNaturalist as a, as a nice resource, and I'm encouraging folks to use it uh, as a tool to get out and kind of learn some of our native bee species. Uh, and with that, I hope that this presentation was useful to folks as a kind of 100-level introduction to bees, why they're so important on the landscape, how we can manage for them as well. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to thank everyone again, and I think that we have uh, plenty of time for questions if there are some questions out there. Sure. Right now we do have a, a couple questions that we'll work on, and before we get to them, I, I would also encourage people, we still have plenty of time. Uh, if you have stuff, just go ahead and post it in the chat window. The first is, do native species and introduced honeybees compete for habitat, or can you safely raise honeybees without affecting the native species? Yeah, that's a great question. In general, it seems that honeybees aren't really negatively impacting our native bee species, at least not very much. Um, and a lot of that is because they're using different floral resources, and, our, and honeybees are kind of selective in terms of some of the plant species that they use. So, so in general, yeah, you can safely raise your honeybees without affecting the native bee species. And if you're doing management activities um, that benefit honeybees, you know, you're putting plants out there for your bees. That's going to benefit the native bee species as well. Okay. Is there any place for um, native bees as a target species in a wildlife management plan for property appraisal purposes? Oh, I love that question. That, I couldn't ask for a better plug. Uh, because of the interest in native pollinators, we have actually recently developed pollinator-specific wildlife management guidelines. Um, those are still kind of in a, a beta testing. We have them out for external review right now, but we've sent those out to some of our technical guidance biologists and our county biologists. So, so there's definitely an option for that, and we hope that that option is going to be growing, uh, particularly next year when we finally get those guidelines finished. We're going to put those online, and we're going to start offering more trainings to our biologists around the state to make sure that everybody knows that that is an option. But, but certainly, uh, we hope to see that in the future. And, and I know of a few examples from a few counties where folks are doing that right now. So this isn't something that's going to just happen in the future. It is going on to some extent already. Okay. When building... A bee garden, would you say, for example, if you're going to do blue bonnets and Indian pinks and milkweeds and black-eyed Susan all next next to each other, would you do the bee boxes in the middle, or what's your, your take on that? Yeah, the bee boxes don't necessarily have to be in the middle. Uh, what you want to do is make sure that you have your nectar resources, your habit, your, your nesting resources, and also water sources within a few hundred meters of one another. Um, the specific orientation or the specific geometry is less important as long as that distance is, isn't too great. Okay, what's your opinion of Africanized honeybees? Yeah, so, so we have Africanized honeybees throughout the state at this point. They're not going anywhere. They're essentially impossible to tell apart from native bee species morphologically. You can't really just look at them and tell the difference. And so, unfortunately, what I tell folks is that if you have a hive and you don't know whether it's a European or Africanized bee, if it's in an area where it potentially poses a threat, like say that they're building in your house or in a tree next to your, uh, your carport, that the safest bet is to assume that it is Africanized. Now, again, the likelihood is that it's not, but the possibility is certainly there. And so you have a couple of options in that instance. You can, in many places, we have beekeeping associations, especially if you're close to a big city. So contact someone at a local beekeeping association. They'll come out, they'll visit the site, they'll look at the bee. And in many instances, 
if they if it's not behaving like an Africanized bee, they'll remove it for you and they'll keep that hive as part of their own colony. Um, you can also get an exterminator to come out as well. But a lot of the behavior is really the best bet. A lot of times the Africanized bee use will they'll, they'll, they'll come up and kind of bump you in the chest or bump you in the head as a warning that if you keep approaching or if you keep disturbing them, then there's going to be some negative consequences. European honeybees will do that as well, but Africanized honeybees start to exhibit that aggressive behavior sooner. Um, so, uh, so Africanized bees are definitely a concern. Okay, if you have land surrounded by agricultural fields, what can you do to safeguard the bees and other pollinators from pesticide overspray? Yeah, that's tough. Really, the best option is to to try to encourage your neighbors to to implement some bee-friendly pesticide application. And there are some tips for that. Uh, basically, spraying at night when the bees aren't active, uh, being mindful of weather patterns, so spraying when it's not windy so that you don't get dripped, uh, and also some of those app, some of the applicators you can vary the size essentially of the of the drop of pesticide and so rather than a fine mist if it's kind of bigger droplets of pesticide then it's not going to drift as far but again that's kind of up to the person that's applying the pesticide or the herbicide okay we still do have some time uh, for some more questions. I wanted to touch on a couple things real quick. I just posted a link up. If you would like to go back and view this webinar later, I'm going to archive it uh, on both YouTube and the Texas Wildlife Association webpage. And so you'll be able to view this as well as all of our other webinars at the link that was provided there in the window.